Amen. Okay, we're in a three-week mini-series. We began it last week, and we've been looking at this question of why did Jesus come? A lot of different people have different answers for that question. Some say, well, he came just to be a good example. He's a good teacher. It's just like, hey, this is a good way to live your life. You're going to be nicer to other people, so just, just be like Jesus. That's an interesting thought and maybe partially true, but there's so much more. Last week, we looked at the idea that Jesus came to reconcile us to the Father. We look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that God knew that because of our sin, we'd actually become his enemy. How many of you know that you are great at sinning? Right? I am too. It's like, have you noticed, those of you that, that you know, have kids, or maybe you're like an auntie or an uncle to some kids, you never have to teach them how to sin. They're just great at it from like a really, really young age. And that sin that we've committed, it's one of those things where it's not just like, oh, you know, could you just stop doing that? That sin is actual treason against God in this kingdom. It, it Literally, when we're sinning and choosing to do life our way instead of his, we're saying, God, I am choosing to be your enemy. And Christ came to reconcile us to the Father. And his coming, you know, reconciliation isn't just, okay, I'm going to come and make sure they don't go to hell, right? And then now we can just kind of like, that's taken care of. We just kind of go se our separate ways. That's how some of us deal with conflict with other people. It's like, oh, you just do your thing. I'm going to do my thing. We're not really going to talk about this anymore. That's not what reconciliation is. Reconciliation is Christ coming so that you no longer are an enemy of God, but you're a friend of God. Christ coming is so that you no longer uh, are a traitor, but you're actually brought into the family of God. You're a son of God or a daughter of the king now. That's what reconciliation is all about. But here's the great thing. That's not the only reason why Christ came. He didn't come just to reconcile you. He actually came to transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness into his kingdom. Now, we're going to talk a lot about kingdom today, and it's such an appropriate topic to talk about. It's Palm Sunday, you know, the story of Jesus coming in, riding as that victorious king into Jerusalem. At least the first time he's doing it. How many of y'all know he's coming back? He's going to do it again. I'm excited about that one. I want to see that one. He's coming as king, and he came as king, and we're going to talk about kingdom today, because part of what we need to understand is that Christ didn't just come simply to get you out of hell and guarantee heaven one day. He came to actually have you learn to walk in his kingdom. There's so much more. There's so much more. Matthew 4, 17 says this, from that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's so interesting. Every time Jesus preached, he talked about the kingdom. He'll use the phrase kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. They're interchangeable. Same thing. He kept referring back to, I'm here because of the kingdom. I'm here about the kingdom. I'm here about the kingdom. And you go, what is that all about? And part of it is we have to understand there's a much bigger story at play than just the issue of sin and hell or righteousness in heaven. And what I'd like to do this morning is actually kind of walk us through God's big story of kingdom, where this began and what it's all about. Now, the story of kingdom actually began right from the very beginning of time. And we have to understand that God has a kingdom, right? And scripture tells us that his kingdom, at least in part, is made up of his creation. This is Psalm chapter 24, verse 1. It says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So all of creation, including you and me, are part of God's kingdom in one sense. We're his. Why? Because he made us. If I make something, I own it, right? Unless I choose to give it away. And so it says everything in all creation is God's. Why? Because he made it. Now what's interesting is God chose kind of a fascinating way to run his kingdom. What he did is he created mankind, Adam and Eve. And he said, my kingdom is actually going to be run by my creatures. I'm going to make these creatures who are going to do things my way, have my values, use my ways of doing things, and they're actually going to have the authority to run my kingdom. 
And those creatures are called humankind. It's Adam and Eve, right? Let me read to you Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Isn't that interesting? Psalm says, all creation, God's. He's a king. Genesis says, I'm giving that authority, God says, to mankind to be stewards of it in my place. So God looks at Adam and Eve and he says, go be fruitful, multiply, and take dominion over the earth. This is what I've created you for, to walk in my kingdom with my kingdom values and with my kingdom authority. How many of y'all know we screwed that up real quick? I mean, it's like God throws the ball to Adam and immediately he just fumbles it. He's tempted by the serpent. Satan comes in, tempts him to eat the fruit, tempts him. Essentially what he's doing is saying, no, 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 no. You don't have to rule the kingdom God's way. You can do it your way. This fruit will give you the knowledge of good and evil. This will give you a different way to do it, a way that's going to be way better than God's way. Now, what's so fascinating is that when Adam sinned, it wasn't just like, oh, death came in and it only affected him. Death came in and it affected all of creation. All of creation now is under that curse of death. The kingdom essentially has just been shaken up. And in that moment, the keys to the kingdom, so to speak, or the authority of the kingdom, or the stewardship of the kingdom is another way to look at it, was actually transferred from mankind to Satan. This is interesting. Where do we learn about this? Well, we learn of it in part in Luke chapter 4 in the temptation of Jesus. Right? He's out in the wilderness. Satan's there tempting him. Look what happens. This is verse 5. It says, The devil took Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms, this is important, all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and said to him, To you I will give all this authority. This is very specific language. All this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. When was it delivered? In the garden. When Adam and Eve sinned, it was like they were handing the stewardship and the keys and the authority of God's kingdom on earth to the devil. And he had been basically running the show ever since. And you look at humanity and you go, yep, that's pretty obvious. Obvious. You look at the history of what happened from Adam and Eve to the time of Christ, and you're like, yeah, that's, that's kind of a no-brainer. I mean, Adam and Eve have two sons. What do they do? One of them kills the other one. It's like almost immediate, right? You see the work of the enemy. You see mankind doing things their way instead of God's way. Sin entered the world, brought chaos to humanity and corruption to all of God's creation. But how many of y'all know God had a plan? He had a plan before he even created the world. He had a plan to take back the authority from the enemy. And his plan is so intriguing to me. You know, if I was God and I go, okay, I made these creatures, they were supposed to walk with the authority that I gave them to rule and steward my kingdom, my way, but they didn't, they messed it up. My thought is going to be, okay, I'm going to come down, I'm going to knock some heads, I'm going to fix this, and be like, guys, get back to work, do it the way I said. But it's not how God did it. God had set up how do I say it? God had set up a, a certain system, a certain plan, a certain way of how his kingdom would be stewarded and ruled. It was through mankind. And God made a sovereign decision to hold himself to that original plan. And so as man had given away the kings of the kingdom, man also had to be the ones to take him back. And so what did God do? He sent Jesus. John will say it like this. The Word became flesh, the Word being God himself, Jesus. The Word became flesh, carne, meat, literally. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have beheld his glory, glories of the only begotten Son, who's full of grace and full I mean, it just goes on, right? What was the plan? 
Well, I gave the keys of the kingdom to Adam. He totally fumbled the ball. So now I'm going to give the keys to my son, God himself, who's going to become one of them and win back what they couldn't hold on to in the first place. So the first Adam brought sin into the world. The second Adam, this is the language of Paul in Romans, came back and won for us what we couldn't win ourselves, the keys of the kingdom. This is so important because Jesus won heaven for us, right? Eternity with the Father after we die. Relationship with him now. But that's not the only thing he won for us. What he was doing was reestablishing his rule and reign on the earth. That's why in Matthew chapter 28, you have the Great Commission, right? We love that. Go make disciples of all nations. Jesus doesn't start the Great Commission with that phrase. He begins it differently in verse 18. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, says Jesus. He's like, I won back the keys of the kingdom. And he says, because all authority has been given to me, there's none left for the enemy. Therefore, you go now in that same authority that you used to have back in the garden, but you surrendered because of your sin. You now go with that authority that I won back for you and go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. This is what Jesus won for us. This is why Jesus came. Now, how many of y'all know heaven would have been enough, Right? Like if there was only one reason Jesus came so I don't have to go to hell and I can go to heaven, it's worthy to be praised like for all eternity. And some of us go, oh, that's, that's, no, no, no. There's so much more than just that. One way of looking at it is that Christ dying as the atoning sacrifice for your sin, the Lamb of God, right? As as John the Baptist declared Jesus Am I cutting in and out? <laughs> Sorry, you guys couldn't see it. Should have sat on that side. Um, one way of looking at it is that Jesus coming to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin wasn't the end in itself, but only a means to the end of him reestablishing our place as stewards of the kingdom. of reestablishing us to the original place that God had created us for. It's amazing. This is what we've been called for. As Jesus came, the declaration of the kingdom came with it. You see John the Baptist, Matthew chapter 3. He's preaching what Matthew calls uh, a baptism of repentance. He says, repent for the kingdom of God is like just around the corner, guys. Why repent? Repentance, changing of mind, recognizing that we're sinners that need God, prepares our heart to receive Christ. So John the Baptist is like, repent, the kingdom of God, it's going to be here any moment, come on. Jesus shows up. We read it, the account of Matthew 4, 17, like one of the first things he preaches is, repent, for the kingdom of God is right in front of you. It's here. Jesus sends out his disciples on multiple occasions. He says, I want you to go and preach. We see one of them in Matthew chapter 10. He says, I want you to go and proclaim that the kingdom of God has arrived. Why? Because the king's here. It was all about kingdom. You've been created to live in the kingdom of God. And when we talk about kingdom, you know, we've got a certain mentality. You know, uh, my family and I got to spend some time in UK last year. It's a kingdom kind of, you know? And when we think of kingdom, most times we think of land, a place, right? That's not the way the Bible describes the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. It's not like he's saying, oh, the kingdom of heaven is way up there and you'll get to that place one day. Literally what the, 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 the scripture is describing when it says the kingdom of God is more a, a state of mind. It's a state of being more than anything else. I'll give you an example. How many of y'all have ever been bored before? I can't remember the last time I've been bored. I feel like boredom would be such a treat. 
like, I've got so many kids. My life is so busy. If I had time to be bored, I'm like, yeah, sign me up for that. That sounds like vacation. Then you go, boredom, what is that? Dumb, D-O-M, literally means the state of being. So boredom is simply the state of being bored. Kingdom mean. It's the state of being under the rule, the values, the systems of a king. And so when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, when he teaches us to pray, you know, hallowed be your name, God, you know, glory to you. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as in heaven. He's not talking physical space or place or like, oh, we're going to get there one day. He's like, no, let the values of God, let his way of doing things become manifest all around me. Now, guess how that's going to be manifested? Through you. Why? Because Jesus earned back the keys of the kingdom earned back the proper stewardship as part of humanity of the kingdom of God. He handed the keys to his disciples and to every disciple that would come after and said, there you go. Go bring the kingdom. Go do the stuff of the kingdom. Now we finally get to Palm Sunday. We get to that moment towards the end of Jesus' ministry. All this, this has been the storyline leading up to this moment. And we come to that day a week before Jesus' crucifixion, about. And here's what happens. This is Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. As they, meaning Jesus and his disciples. Now, how many of y'all realize that Palm Sunday, the story of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, actually begins with like a car hijacking? It's an interesting story. Look at this. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, hey, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. Now, we read this story so much. If you grew up in church, back in the day, maybe you saw the flannel graph of Jesus on the donkey. And we're just like, wow, yeah, the disciples went and the donkeys were just waiting for them. It's like they were prepared for them. And we don't realize what a risk that was. It'd be like if Jesus came today and said, hey, I need you to hitchhike down to Puna. And you're going to get to this spot and you're going to see a lifted Tacoma truck. And I want you to get in it and there's going to be keys in it. Don't, don't worry about what's around you. There's going to be keys in it. I want you to start up that thing, and I want you to drive it back here. Now, if anyone comes after you with a crowbar or a shotgun, I just want you to say, Jesus told me to do it. And they're going to be totally fine with that. This is what Jesus was asking. Now, can you see how much courage it took for those two disciples to be obedient to Jesus? There's times when Jesus tells us to do something, and it takes courage to obey him. But if it really is him telling us to do it, we know it's going to work out. We can trust him. We can trust him enough to obey him, even when he asks us to do things that just seem ridiculous to us. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Verse 4, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter Zion, that's That's Israel, God's people. See, your king. Now listen to this language. This is all kingdom language. It's very, very specific. See, your king comes to you gentle. Tuck that word into your mind. We're going to come back to that. Gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road. Well, others cut branches, and we're told from John's gospel, I believe it is, that it was palm branches, thus the name Palm Sunday, cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that follow shouted, Hosanna! Now, the word Hosanna literally in the Greek is a transliteration of of a word in the Hebrew that simply means save, or save us, God, or save us now, hurry up, it's the right time to do it. And so they're shouting out, Hosanna, notice the kingly language right after this, to the son of David. David who? King David. The one whom it was prophesied would eventually give birth in his lineage to the Savior, to the Messiah, to the King. 
Hosanna to the son of David. They're saying, they're praising Jesus going, you're the Messiah. And at the same time saying, now hurry up and do the thing and save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Now it's interesting. This, this gets said all the time. I, I almost hate saying it because I've heard it so much. But the Hosanna that the crowd was shouting for was the peace that a king would bring, but it was a political peace. And Jesus said, essentially, that's not the kind of peace I'm going to bring right now. What Jesus was bringing was not a political peace, but a personal peace. It was a peace that for any person who would receive him would transcend, overcome any political situation that they found themselves in. It was a peace, a personal peace that would transcend, overcome any circumstance, however difficult it might be, whether famine, drought, personal hardship and relationships. It didn't matter. It was a peace that would actually transform the person and not just the systems. A peace that would transform the person and not just the politics. This is what Jesus was bringing. Now, it's so interesting and so significant that scripture records that Jesus came on a donkey and he came in a gentle manner. Now, this was something that was very familiar to all who were there. This was a, a kingly procession into a city. And what would often happen is when a king was king of a city, or if a king had taken dominion over a city, he would ride in, and he would ride in in one of two ways, either on a war horse or on a donkey. And you would look at what he was riding on, and it would communicate a message to you. I'll give you an example. Let's say you had, um, let's say... You had a president or a warlord. Pick your favorite. I don't care. And they're riding into a town they've just conquered, and they're riding in on a tank. And they've got an AK-47 strapped to their back, and they've got all you know the military around them. What message is that communicating? Hey, you better stay in line, and if you don't, right? Now, picture... If instead that president came strolling in without the army, but he's just cruising in an old 1989 Chrysler LeBaron with the top down, wood paneling on the sides, no bodyguards, nothing. He's just cruising into that. T do you guys even know what a LeBaron is? Okay, some of you do. Went off. My grandparents had one. I loved it. He's just cruising in with the top down. What is that communicating? I'm here in peace. I'm not worried about having to, to crack heads. I'm coming because I'm coming in peace and I'm coming to bring peace. Jesus was riding on a donkey in a gentle manner. He says, I'm coming to bring peace, not war. I'm coming to bring peace. And how many of y'all know that Jesus is coming again and he's coming on a horse the second time? It's a book of Revelation. He's going to come and not just bring a personal peace the second time, but a political peace. Every knee will bow, whether they're choosing to do so willfully or not, when Christ returns. But this is a moment, this is a season where all of us get to willfully choose. Not just to bow to a king in submission, but to actually receive the peace and transformation and the life that that king is offering. So here comes Jesus, and he's riding on a donkey, and he's communicating to everyone what he is bringing as king. And what he was bringing was a whole new way of life. He's saying, guys, I, I took back the keys of the kingdom, and I'm handing them to you. I want you to live completely different than you're living right now. The opportunity for you to walk in authority and stewardship over this kingdom is now present again. And it's so important. I, I don't know how you envision your Christian life, but it's kind of an important question to ask yourself. Like, what, what do I really think following Jesus is all about? Is it just, okay, Christ died on the cross, so I don't have to go to hell. This is great. Happy about heaven. Now I just need to be, you know, a good person. All my energy is going towards not sinning so that I don't tick God off in the meantime and he changes his mind. Like, is that how you envision Christianity? 
Because if it is, you're missing it completely. Because Jesus came and reconciled you fully and wholly to the Father and has handed you the keys and said, now I want you to go in and I want you to walk in the kingdom. I want you to do things God's ways. Use his values, bring his systems from heaven to earth. And you go, well, what does that actually look like? Because how many of y'all know the kingdom of God just functions so differently than the kingdom of the world, right? Let's just take a couple, couple examples. Hunger. Ever been hungry before? I'm hungry right now. By the way, did you guys try those chocolate chip oatmeal things that our, our hospitality team provided? Those are awesome. I've never had those before. Right? Hunger, kingdom of God, works different than the kingdom of the world. And in the natural, you get hungry when you don't eat. In the kingdom, it's just the opposite. In the kingdom of God, you actually get hungry and hungrier the more you eat. The more you spend time feasting upon the word of God and his presence, you get satisfied and completely dissatisfied at the same time because you just get hungrier for it. That's how it works in the kingdom. Uh, let's take another example, enemies. Anybody have enemies? Yeah. <laughs> Rex is like, uh-huh. Any of you sitting next to your enemy right now? That'd be interesting. This could get spicy. How, enemies, how do we deal with them in the natural? You get revenge. And it, you know, if you're kind of more a sheepish person or just more kind-hearted, maybe it's not revenge, but maybe you're just like, I'm never talking to them again. I'm not getting close to them. I'm just like, we're just going to go our own ways. I'm not going to deal with you anymore. That's the way we deal with enemies in the natural. How do we deal with enemies in the kingdom? Jesus says, I want you to love them. And how many of y'all know you can't love someone kingdom-wise from a distance? This is where it gets different. I, I want to read you a passage. I really felt like this was a prophetic passage for a few of us in particular. Luke 6, 27. Jesus is speaking. He says, but to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. Do you see all the action words there? How do we treat people as we're stewarding the kingdom? How do we live the values of heaven when we have real enemies here on earth? He says, I want you to love them. I want you to do good to them. I want you to bless them. I want you to pray for them. Why? Because that's God's way, and that's exactly what Christ did for you when you screwed up everything. And he says, this is the way of the kingdom. This is how we do it in the kingdom. Go and do it. And you're like, okay, love me. And he's like, okay, this, I'm kind of getting it, but this is still like, I'm just not sure. Like, what is this whole new way of life, walking in the kingdom? What does this actually look like? I'll tell you the best way to figure that out, and it's simply this. Look at Jesus and do what he did. Okay, we're going to take a little quiz. How many of y'all like quizzes? I hate them, but we're going to take one this morning, okay? This is called, I don't know what to call it. We'll call it the Jesus Kingdom Life Quiz, okay? Whatever. Here's the, here's the first question. You guys ready? What did Jesus do when people were hungry? You guys are really uncertain. <laughs> what did Jesus do when people were hungry? He fed them. Okay, so what's this new way of life of walking in the kingdom? Here's how it works. Find a hungry person and give them some food. Okay, second question. What did Jesus do when someone was sick or injured? He healed them. So what do we do now that we've been given the keys of the kingdom and told to walk as Jesus walked? You find someone who's sick, you find someone injured, and you say, can I pray for you? Jesus used to heal people, and he's still healing people today, and I just want to pray that Jesus heals you. Third question, you guys are doing great. You're like 10 for 10 right now. What did Jesus do when someone was an outcast of society? There's a lot of different, yeah. He brought them near, right? He befriended them. He loved them. He showed them how valuable they were to God. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes we're like, oh, there's an outcast. So I'm going to tell them how valuable they are to God. How many of y'all know that sometimes your words are meaningless because you're telling them you're valuable to God, but with your actions, you're telling them you're not valuable to me? And sometimes the way that people know that they are valuable to God is as you demonstrate to them first that they are valuable to you. And this is the way of the kingdom. This is how God does things. This is what it means to walk with the authority of the king. 
Here's here, another question. What did Jesus do when someone was harassed by demons? He dealt with the demons. All right, what does that mean for us? When you see someone being harassed by a demon, step into the authority that Christ won back for you and say, yeah, that needs to stop. It's what John Wimber called doing the stuff. You walk in the kingdom by doing the stuff of the kingdom. Hungry person, feed them. Person that needs an encouraging word, give it to them. Someone who's sick, heal them. Someone who's harassed by demons, go after that demon. Step into authority and say, nope, you don't get to do that anymore. Several, a couple years ago, I guess it was, there, there was a gal, and in, in, I got this phone call from her friend who was a part of our church, and she was just like extremely harassed by demons. And all this crazy stuff was happening in her home. She was seeing things, things were moving, like it was, it was pretty full on. And so she asked, hey, can you, can you meet with this friend that's dealing with all this stuff? And so Sarah and I go and we share the gospel with her on a Saturday. She gives her life to Jesus, reconciled to God, like we talked about last week. The next day is church and we happen to be doing baptisms. So she gets water baptized the next day. Monday, I go in with a few friends, kind of like a strike team. And we're like, hey, can we come to your house? We're just going to pray over your house so all this crazy stuff stops happening. So we go up there, and it's a wild story. I don't have time to tell the whole thing. But we walk in, and there's just like every imaginable occult object, you know, just everywhere. And we're just like, hey, you know what? You don't need these anymore because you belong to Jesus. You don't need these to have power. You have all power in Christ because Christ has all power. She's like, oh, good. I didn't really like them anyways. I didn't like the way they made me feel. So we get trash bags. We're just like throwing stuff in there. But then these demons start harassing her as we're in her house. Pretty extreme stuff. So we're just praying for her, and it's awesome. And these things are starting to leave, and stuff's starting to come off her. But then we do what Jesus tells us to do, and we disciple her in this moment. And we're like, hey, you've stepped into the kingdom. You belong to Jesus. You have authority over these, these demons that are harassing you. She's like, I do? I was like, yeah, you can tell them to leave. Great. She starts delivering herself. It was amazing. This needs to go right now. And, da, da, da. and she's just like getting so free. It's amazing. It's just beautiful. Now, we get done. This is after probably three hours. And we're, she's walking us back to our car. And it's like, you, you had to see it. It was like visible. Like her eyes had this brightness in this life that just wasn't there before we had come. And she looks at my buddy and I, and she says, okay, so I just have to ask a question. I'm like, what? She's like, is this what like, you do every day? Is this what it looks like to be a Christian? And I was just like, I mean, kind of, maybe not every day, but yeah, this is, this is the stuff of, of being a Christian. When someone's harassed by a demon, we deal with it. She's like, oh, okay, okay. Can I ask you another question? Uh, this is my favorite. She says, do I get to feel this good every day? <laughs> that one, I need the, the right answer. She was like, absolutely. This is the freedom that Christ brings. It's not just being reconciled to God. It's knowing that you've been brought into his kingdom and doing the stuff of the kingdom. I'm going to talk about one last verse, and then we're going to close because I need to practice for next week where I absolutely have to stay to an hour or else there's going to be such chaos between services. <laughs> John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to a Jewish religious leader, a guy who was kind of weary of hanging out with Jesus because of what it might cost him and his reputation. But eventually, he gives his life to Jesus, but he hasn't yet. And he's asking Jesus all these questions. And Jesus just begins talking about the kingdom. Why? Because it's Jesus. And it's what he came to bring. And he looks at Nicodemus and he says, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And it's so fascinating because so many of us, what happens is we get born again, we're reconciled to God, receive justification, the theological term for it. Our sins are dealt with. We're now counted righteous before our Father, but not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We've been born again. We're like, we're in the kingdom. And it's like God opens the door to the kingdom and we walk through it. And then we're just like, wow, it's the kingdom. And we just stop right there and we stand at the door for the rest of our lives. I maybe have shared this illustration with you before, but it's a little bit like going to Disneyland. Has anyone been to Disneyland before? Has anyone taken kids to Disneyland before? I don't know why we say that that's fun. It's clearly not fun, and yet we keep doing it. That is one definition of insanity. 
But okay, imagine with me, you're taking your whole family. I've got five kids. They're like, you know, when I go to Disneyland, I have to pull a second mortgage out on my house. So let's say you did that. You gave your life savings away. You've bought all the tickets for all your kids. You, you know, you go through the turnstile, you, you give them the ticket, it goes through the machine, and you walk through, and you see the castle, and you see that big flower arrangement with Mickey Mouse right at the front, and you're just like, this is amazing, and the kids start running. But you're a good dad or a good mom, so you've got the leashes on all of them. You jerk them back, and you're like, come here, kids. I want to I show you something. I'm like, Dad, I want to go on the ride. Say, no, 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 come here, come here. And you're right in front of the turnstiles. You're blocking traffic. You're like, guys, look. It's the kingdom. We're in the kingdom. And they're like, I know, Dad. Come on, we're going to go right there. No, 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 no. We're here, guys. And this is where we're going to stay for the next 12 hours until closing. Because look, it's the kingdom. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of in my life. Exactly. Yet that's how some of us live our Christian lives. You've been reconciled. You're in. You've walked through the door. It's almost as if Jesus just wants to give you a nice little boot in the booty and say, now go do the stuff. I've won the keys back. Here they are. You have the authority that you had given away because it's all mine and I've deputized you to steward my kingdom, to do what God originally designed you to do, to go do the stuff of the kingdom, but you can't stay put at the door. You're in, but you can't stay put at the door. You got to go do the stuff of the kingdom. When you see someone who's down and out, help them, tell them about me. When you see someone who's sick, pray for them and heal them. When you see someone harassed by a demon, deal with the demon. We're doing this stuff for the kingdom. This is why Jesus came, not just to get you out of hell, but to transfer you from the kingdom of darkness back into the kingdom of God so that you could steward it, so that you could bring his values, his ways, his systems, so that our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done here through me as it is in heaven. That's what you were born for. And I guarantee you, that's what I'm gonna be preaching about every week, every Sunday until I die, how we do the stuff of the kingdom together as a family to make a difference in this world. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you so much for your great love for us. Thank you that you came. Thank you that you reconciled us. I mean, if that was the only thing you did, it it was so enough. But not only did you reconcile us, you placed us back into such a high and privileged position to be called your sons and daughters with all the rights of inheritance and the rights and responsibilities of stewardship. We're princes and princesses in your kingdom, so to speak. We've got authority and power, not because it's ours, but it comes from you. It's delegated, but you've given it to us. You trust us enough. You've given that to us. And Father, we just want to steward it well. It is so fun to do the stuff of the kingdom. Thank you for that, Lord. And I'm just asking Jesus this week, open our eyes up, and help us to see kingdom opportunities and to go for it. And pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen.